thank all of you for coming. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to stand up here and talk to so many colleagues and friends uh, and students and random people who I don't know. Uh, uh, Jordan called me the newest professor. In fact, I'm not. So um, well, I guess I'll first, I'm going to give some thanks and apologies and then talk about these things. Uh, why we have to use the ideas of randomness to make any inference about the universe, and especially about the universe on the very largest scales. And then I'll, I'll argue that maybe we do have such a model for the whole universe, and uh, that we learn about this largely by making measurements of something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And I'll talk about some specific set of observations that I've had the good fortune to be involved in with the Planck satellite, and then some future things, and actually some things that have happened only in the last few months. So first, though, uh, some apologies. So uh, I'm not the newest professor in the department. In fact, I've been professor since 2007, I believe. It's so long ago I don't remember. Uh, uh, I'm not, however, the longest without having given an uh, inaugural lecture. In fact, I think the head of department actually is longer than me. Uh, uh, as are some other members of the department, so um, you'll have them to look forward to, although I suspect he'll want to wait till after his head of departmentship is over before he puts in the time to do this. Uh, another reason, though, why, it's, why I wanted to wait this long, or a reason why I did want to wait this long, was first that I wanted to wait until uh, the Planck satellite was launched. Now, unfortunately, the contrast here in this room is terrible, so you can't see, but that's a rocket. Uh, and on the very top of this very big explosive thing, um, is a couple of satellites, uh, or are a couple of satellites, Planck and Herschel. Planck was the cushion uh, for Herschel, uh, so it got banged around a bit, but it made it all the way uh, a million miles away from the Earth to, the, to where it's sitting or where it sat for many years. We'll talk more about that. Um, another reason why it, it turns out in retrospect it was very good to wait until this is that um, we are actually in the first day of the second half century since the CMB was discovered. So in fact, the uh, uh, Penzias and Wilson, whom I'll talk about later, uh, went out on May 20th of 1964 to use this telescope in my home state of New Jersey uh, a couple years before I was born. And uh, with this, they discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this is sort of an auspicious date uh, on which to be giving, giving this talk. Um, I admit I'm, I'm a little nervous here, um, even though I've stood in, the, in this very position talking to students uh, about quantum mechanics and other things uh, many times. I'm a bit nervous. The last time I was this nervous, though, um, I have to beep. Uh, yeah, it was about uh, three weeks ago when uh, uh, I was, this, this was a few minutes before I looked like this. Um, so I, I knew that, I had a feeling that Jordan was going to show an embarrassing picture of me in something tight. Uh, so I figured I would, I would trump him by showing an even more embarrassing picture. Um, but you could at least be distracted by looking at my wife, whose name is Lisa, uh, <laughs> over there. I think the Mary's somewhere back there. Um, <laughs> So with that to keep you from taking me too seriously for the next half an hour or so, um, I will nonetheless try to talk a little bit about science. Uh, so in order to do that, I want to start with a quote from one of my favorite, uh, he's actually a scientific hero, despite the fact that in the last few years he's become a bit of a, sadly, a climate change denialist. Um, but uh, Freeman Dyson uh, has described some of the process of science very well recently. The whole point of science is that most of it is uncertain. The public, of course, imagines that science is just a set of facts, but it's not. Science is a process of exploring, which is always partial. We explore, we find things we, don't underst we do understand, we find out things we thought we understood that were wrong. That's how we make progress. So it's all this uncertainty, of course, is what makes science interesting and fun for the scientists, but we have to understand how we can encode that uncertainty, because we're never going to know all there is to know. The amount of data we can get about the universe is always a tiny fraction of all the information that you might imagine is available to us. So we encode this uncertainty as probability. And so you know, we kind of all have an intuitive understanding of what we mean by probability. Something is nearly a probability of one if we think it's true, and it's a probability of zero if we think it's false. But of course, everything depends on not just the statement you're making, but in what context you're putting that statement. So we want to know the probability of some theory, but not in the abstract. We want to know the probability of some theory given the data that we have about the world. Right? So, you know, for example, sorry, this got a little bit, bit uh, shrunken in the conversion here. But, you know, if we have some coin, we want to know, well, what's the probability if I flip it that it comes out of, as heads or tails? Well, that depends on a lot of things. So you might say, well, it's obviously just 50-50. Right? There's two choices, heads and tails, and it could be either one. But you know, first of all, it might be the case that I know how to toss a coin so that it comes up heads every time. 
Or it might be that I've you know, called the magic shop and I've gotten a two-headed coin. So you need to know coin theory to be able to understand the outcome of your coin flip experiment, right? to be able to predict the outcome of your coin flip experiment. Now, once you have that data, of course, the probabilities collapse down to whatever you got. Right? Once I've seen it come up heads, then fine, it's heads. Now, that works well when all you care about is the thing that you're actually looking at is the thing that you're measuring. But in cosmology, we don't measure directly the quantities we care about. We measure a bunch of information about the universe, and we need to use that information to infer things like the amount of matter in the universe. OK, well, even that, we need to know, well, what theory, what set of theories do we have? For example, if we're in the Big Bang theory, that's one way to do it. But if we had some other theory for the universe, then the same data might give us a different answer. Right, so this idea of taking some, some information that we had that we just were looking at some nickel, and then we get some more information, we condition on the data, that process is something that I'll talk a lot about uh, over the next few minutes. But first, let me give you an example of, a th of some data and a theory that we use to describe that data. Of course, a very important example of that is what Hubble found in 1929, which is he basically made some assumptions about the properties of galaxies that they were, to some extent, and this is making things a lot simpler than they actually are, they were more or less standard candles. They were all the same size, and when he did, the same brightness. And when he did that, he found that things further away, he could use that and we could see their velocities by looking at how, their li how their, uh, their, their, the spectrum of those things were changing. We could look at, and we could see that more distant objects are moving faster. And he found that the velocity is proportional to the distance, and today we call that constant of proportionality Hubble's constant, or H naught. And it turns out, if you think about what's happening, if you, take, if you took this and you stretched it out, so the way it looks here, it looks like you're sitting in the center and stretching from there, but if you think about it, all we've done is we've just stretched it evenly in all directions. So there's no real center. We happen to be only showing some little rectangular bit of it, but this is isotropic expansion. Any observer would see exactly the same thing. So we might say, this is great. So if we trace back in time, this looks like it started out all small and dense. So this is good. This is good evidence for, for the Big Bang theory. But also it turns out that if you change your theoretical setting a little bit and you allow matter to be created, then you can also say this is also good evidence for a steady state universe, where by having sort of matter being slowly created at all, over all cosmological time, everywhere, then you could have either the same data be consistent with either of these two models. So it took other data to be able to decide between these things. So cosmological data, though, and caught in the way it matches to cosmological theories, is always a bit dangerous. So I like to bring out this quote. So this is a famous uh, sort of pundit political philosopher, Arthur Kersler, who wrote a book about cosmology, which I highly recommend. Uh, the history of cosmic theories may, without exaggeration, be called a history of collective obsessions and controlled schizophrenias. So you can look around at the cosmologist you know and decide whether this applies or not. But it is an important uh, corrective uh, to use when probably you're listening to the whole rest of the talk. But we do have a model. And let's take as a template model the Big Bang Theory. So I'll just write down this equation, which you're not meant to understand. It's just to prove that we can use Einstein's relativity and write down one equation which describes on the very largest scales essentially everything there is to see. And we can use the fact that in the Big Bang Theory, things are expanding. And if you're not creating any new matter over time, then if you think about what happens with a gas, and you know how this works because you have a refrigerator at home, and here's a typical refrigerator in the Jaffe household. Uh, <laughs> we have a refrigerator home which keeps things cool by expanding gas. Right? So the, if things are getting cooler over time, then if you went back in time, they were hotter. So the Big Bang Theory says that the early universe was hot. Now, this is good because this lets you figure out whether you're in a steady state universe or a Big Bang universe if you can figure out a way that being hot early on would have changed things. And indeed, we have several observations we can make that would be different if the universe weren't hot early on. Now, one thing we can do is we can look at the universe today, and we can look at the way matter is moving around in the universe today, and we can use these standard candles. So here are two candles, and if you believe that they're the same brightness intrinsically, then, you're, then these are roughly the same distance away, but, if, you know, but this one maybe is a little bit further away than this, but you need to understand something about the properties of those candles. 
And in fact, we can, look at, we can look at motions on top of this overall isotropic Hubble flow, it's called. And we can use that to measure something about the lumpiness of the matter distribution, because that lumpiness pulls on individual galaxies separate from that isotropic expansion. And in fact, um, with, uh, with some of the guests here, um, I, we've done some work trying to use these sorts of data to tease out information about the present day universe. So for example, in this picture, this is a picture of the whole sky. So you take us to the sphere of the sky and you just unwrap it. And red things are galaxies that are moving away from us, and blue things are galaxies that are moving towards us. And we've used that data, those data, to try to interpret the present day universe. Now the way we do some of these interpretations is by using the very famous Bayes theorem. So I'll explain what this is in a minute, but first I, I uh, recommend that all of you go to Bunhill Fields, which is not more than a few miles away, and uh, you can visit the tomb of the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who died in 1761. This is the family tomb. It's being, at least the last I checked, it's the upkeep was being done actually by a hedge fund in New Jersey uh, for some reason. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why, um, but, uh, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a great place. And in fact, it's a great little cemetery as, you know, London, coming from New Jersey, London is a very historic place. Um, another person who's, who's buried there is uh, another favorite of mine, um, William Blake. Um, we don't know exactly where he's buried, but this, this uh, headstone says it's near where the body is. Um, now, uh, Blake's quote apropos of today is, I must create a system or a model of the universe, right? or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare my business, his business, uh, is to create. Uh, now people, uh, a lot of scientists love Blake and they, they see this picture and they're like, wow, that's Isaac Newton. They, he, Blake thought he was a Superman. No, he hated Newton because he hated Newton's system. Right? So he thought this was just him sort of creating the universe, taking the place of God. Well, you can, you can have an opinion on that one way or the other. Um, Blake was a great poet, maybe not such a great natural philosopher, uh, but uh, it's important to know that, you know, the whole point of doing science is you can look at systems, you can make models, and you can test them, right? So Blake might not have been a big fan of the testing of models, but he understood that you do have to, have to make models in order to apply them to the world. So back to Bayes. So this is Bayes' famous theorem, so we can take it apart a little bit. So this is how to learn from data in the light of a given hypothesis. So this bit on the right, on the left-hand side, is what we care about. It's the probability of some hypothesis given some amount of data that we can gather. And those things depend, or this thing depends, upon these two bits, mostly on the upstairs here, of the right-hand side, the prior, which is the probability of your hypothesis if you didn't know what the data were, times the probability that you got that particular data, those particular data, given that that hypothesis that you're testing is true. And if you can calculate what this thing is and you can impose what this thing is. So this depends only on your model and, under, and any other background information you're taking to the problem. And if you can calculate these two things, then you can learn from your data. So this is what science is all about, right? Learning from your data. So here's a model. Here's part of the Big Bang model, one of the repercussions of the fact that the early universe was very hot. So early on, it was hot enough that it could keep hydrogen ionized. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is a proton and an electron circling around it, quantum mechanically, so not really circling. And if you have enough energy around, then you can strip that electron off and have separate protons and electrons. That's called an ionized plasma. And it turns out, although it's not completely obvious, that an ionized plasma is more or less opaque to photons. And that's because these bare charged particles, the plus proton and the minus electron, like to deflect po photons, that is particles of light, out of their paths. But when it's neutral, once you tightly bind the electron to the proton, it looks just like a little sphere without any charge, and you don't notice the charges, so the light goes right through. So unfortunately, again, this didn't come out too well, but this is supposed to be this ionized plasma over here with the, with the photons bouncing around, and this is neutral hydrogen with the photons going right through. But now, in a cosmological setting, when you look further away, you're looking back in time because light travels at one light year per year, right? So that's a much easier way to remember the speed of light than, than in <laughs> centimeters per second. So if we're looking back in time, or if we're looking further away, then the universe was transparent, 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 until you get to a point where it was opaque. 
So it's just like looking at the surface of a cloud, right? The surface of a cloud is somewhere where it's opaque to light, but then on your side of the cloud, it's transparent. So just like by looking at the sun through a cloud, you can infer something about the sun. By looking at the light that comes through this surface, we can infer something about what happened before then. That is the early universe. Right? And so this only happens in the Big Bang because it was hot early on. So the very existence of this thing, of these photons, is evidence for the Big Bang. And this, these photons are called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So it was first observed by these guys, Penzias and Wilson, again in New Jersey. And they're, this, this, so the big reveal here, so their first picture of the microwave background, and they didn't, they didn't uh, have the, the, tech, the drawing technology to do this, but a, a modern way of showing this would be this. So uh, this is the whole sky unwrapped, and it's basically uniform over the whole sky. So at the ability that they, with the ability of th that they had to measure the temperature, it looks like something that's glowing with a temperature of three degrees above absolute zero. Almost completely uniform. Well, to their, to the ability that they had, it was completely uniform. And this is this relic radiation, these photons that were left over from early on, the microwave background. This is the paper they wrote. This is the whole paper they wrote <laughs> to announce this, for which they won the Nobel Prize. So the, the title of the paper is not, we found the beginning of the universe. The title of the paper is a measurement of excess antenna temperature at 4 1080 megacycles per second. They do not mention cosmology, except in this little paragraph here, very close to the beginning, a possible explanation for the observed excess noise temperature is the one given by Dickey, Peebles, Rawl, and Wilkinson, 1965, in a companion letter in this issue. It so happens that Dickey, Peebles, Rawl, and Wilkinson, aside from being good cosmologists, were trying to build an instrument to do what this experiment did at the same time, in Princeton, down the road from Holmdel, New Jersey. So it is better to be lucky and to have a really good instrument. So they were incredibly good experimental astrophysicists, but they didn't know what they were looking for. Serendipity is really important in science. So this is the first observation of the microwave background. By the end of the 60s, instrumentation had gotten good enough that you could actually resolve the fact that if you looked in one direction on the sky, it was actually a bit hotter than in other directions on the sky. That was evidence that we were moving with respect to this bath of photons. Because when you move towards something, it increases its frequency, the Doppler shift. And when you move away from something, it decreases it. So if there's a uniform bath and you move with respect to that, it's hot in the direction you're moving, it's cold in the direction against which, from which you're coming. That was the process, that was the state of things until the late 80s, when the COBE satellite was launched. And in 1991, they announced their first results. This is a bit later than the 1991 results, where you can now zoom in. And there were already hints of some of this going on here. So this, you subtract off the average, and you get this. You subtract off this pattern, and you get this pattern. This red swath is not the early universe. It's our Milky Way galaxy, which even though we're in the center of, is more or less a band across the sky, as you've been lucky enough to go where it's really dark, and you can see the Milky Way. I don't think I saw the Milky Way until I was in my 20s. But above and below that, these fluctuations are from the early universe. So they also won the Nobel Prize. They knew what they were looking for this time. Other people were also looking at the same time, but they had far and away the best instrument, although arguably other people actually had some of these fluctuations in their data at the same time as well. From then, we moved on, so I was lucky enough to be involved in the late 90s in an experiment called Maxima, where we just looked at a small 10 degree by 10 degree patch of the sky, but with much higher sensitivity and resolution than COBE. And then that was superseded in the early 2000s by the WMAP satellite, which went from this picture to this picture. So obviously, the, roughly speaking, things are the same, but your, your ability to see much more fine structure is obvious from this picture compared to this. So this is the early 90s, this is the early 2000s. Let's look at this picture, though, a little bit more and try to understand it. So let's think about the scales that are working on the sky. 
So today, we have to worry about the distance that you could imagine getting a signal from or sending a signal to. So if you started out in the early universe, and you, know, you did some Morse code or some, some semaphore signal to use light, go as far as you could, then how far could you get? Well, you get the age of the universe times the speed of light. And again, we can go back to our excellent one light year per year speed of light. And we can multiply that by 14 billion years, and we get 14 billion light years. Roughly speaking, and there are some, some uh, detailed issues about exactly what this means that my cosmologist friends can, can complain about. But roughly speaking, this is how far something could go in 14 billion years. When the CMB was formed, though, the universe wasn't 14 billion years old. It was about 400,000 years old. So the equivalent of that is 400,000 light years or so. Now, the problem with that is that 400,000 light years on the sky, if we're looking far, this far back, is only about one degree. So why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because one degree here is, you know, maybe that's the size of this little red dot. It's probably smaller than that. One degree here. So these things shouldn't have been in contact with one another. There should be no way for them to have gotten to roughly the same temperature. But to one part in 10 to the 5, now this picture, of course, is zooming, zooming, zooming in. But really, the picture to think about, oops, wrong, wrong one, is this first picture up here, where at the ability to look here, this is exactly the same temperature as this. So how did these things get to be the same temperature? And we'll, we'll worry about that more towards the end of the talk. But the nice thing about this one degree is also it gives a typical scale for things that you might be able to make on the CMB. So a typical spot size is about a degree here. And in fact, mathematically, we can, we can use that, and physically, we can use that to trace out what's going on at this surface, at this cloud surface that we see. So what can we, what can we do that? What can we use that for? Well, one thing we can use that for is to measure the curvature of the universe. So one thing you know about the universe, if you believe in the Big Bang and you believe in general relativity, is that it has the possibility of being curved on very large scales. So what does that mean? So that means, well, of course, I can only give you an analogy because nobody that I know can picture four, four dimensions in their head. So pretend the universe was only two dimensions, and you could then think of it being embedded in a third dimension. So we sort of typically think, think of space as being flat, but it could be curved. It could be curved like a sphere, or it could be curved like a saddle. And if things are roughly uniform on very large scales, then those are the only choices. You can scale the saddle or the sphere up, make them different sizes, but they're the same shape. And if you do geometry on a sphere or a saddle or a plane, you get different kinds of results. So on a plane, now you can't really see, but there's a red triangle here. And of course, we all know that on a, a triangle on a plane, angles add up to 180 degrees. But if you think about a triangle on a sphere, so make a big triangle on the Earth, then it adds up to more than 180 degrees, because you could have two points on the equator. You can go up at 90 degrees from both of them. You meet at the top, so that's a triangle. And you can meet at any angle you want. So you've already got 180 degrees down here. So you can add, 100, you can add 180 and add anything else, and you can still make a triangle. And it turns out the opposite happens in a saddle. You get less than 180 degrees. That's pretty obvious from looking at this, that you get less than 180 degrees out of this triangle here. So if you can just measure a big triangle, then you can see the geometry of all there is. So that's a pretty useful thing to be able to do. And we can do that using the CMB, because we have a scale. We have a, we have a size that we know. And this is this one degree scale, roughly. It's a physical size we know. So it, if, the, if with this one degree, of course, I haven't drawn it as one degree here. But if we have some particular physical scale that we know, we can measure its angle. And in a flat universe, then it would kind of make an angle like that. But in a closed universe, in the sphere, those same lines would curve in. So you get a larger angle corresponding to that same physical size up there. Or conversely, if you were in a universe that was curved like a saddle, then the same physical scale maps to a smaller angle. So if you can measure the angular size on the sky, so I called it one degree because I know the answer. But really, what I want to posit is that we know more or less the physics of that. So we know the physical scale in centimeters or meters or kilometers. And it turns out that that ends up being about a degree. So we then want to match up that degree scale to that physical size and use that to measure the geometry of the universe. So here's a kind of cartoon of it. If you change this parameter, and I haven't mentioned this parameter before, but omega 
which tells you whether you're in a sphere or a saddle or a flat universe, and it's just one for the flat universe, and it has any number greater than one or less than one for the other two cases. And as you change omega, you change the size of spots on the microwave background sky. And because relativity teaches us that what makes the curvature is the stuff in the universe, that if we measure this number, we've measured the amount of stuff in the universe. What we'd like to do is measure more than that. We'd like to measure the kind of stuff. And it turns out that's a bit harder for the microwave background alone. It's sensitive more or less roughly to this geometry, but not really to what kind of stuff it is. But we can use this to determine at least some aspects of that and learn things about the universe or at least inputs to things about the universe that we might still want to know. And I'm not going to touch on this talk very much, but of course we have this information that the universe is accelerating in its expansion over time, and that's something that the CMB can't really see directly but can help determine the parameters of. So to do the most modern measurements of this, At ah, good. One, um, we use the Planck satellite. Un, top. I wasn't expecting the, the sound to actually come on. Um, so this is Planck being launched. This is a cartoon of Planck in orbit, um, not, not rotating at the, right, at the right frequency. And of course, we weren't there to see it, so this is just an artist's impression. But there's Planck going up. I was there. It's very nerve-wracking. I don't know anything to care about at the top of this very, very dark So this is Planck, kind of the inverse of Planck. It's seven months, it observes the whole sky, and you can make a picture of what the sky looks like after about seven months. Before it starts again. Um, right, so this, so Planck is, well, uh, compared to what uh, our chair works on, medium-sized science. So uh, this is uh, the many dozens of institutions uh, involved in the Planck satellite, uh, several hundred uh, scientists, about 400. Um, so this is, again, compared to the thousands that do particle physics on a single experiment nowadays, this is unwieldy big, but, uh, but small compared to other things. Um, and uh, none of the things I will talk about, uh, certainly from now on, would be possible without uh, the hard work of, of, of many of these people, some of whom are, are actually in the room right now. So here's, here's a picture of Planck. I'm not a hardware guy, so this is kind of just me saying, oh, isn't it cool? Um, but it is pretty cool. Uh, so these are both, you know, engineering type drawings. Um, this, so the, the clear bit is not really clear on the real thing, but it's just to show you um, the different instruments. So this, this circular thing in the middle is called the high frequency instrument, and it basically uses little, little thermometers. And these horns out here are called the low frequency instrument, and it's basically small radio receivers. So very different technologies. This is one of my favorite pictures. Unfortunately, it is very hard to see. Um, this is an actual picture of Planck. So these are engineering drawings. This is really it. This is a picture of the focal plane reflected in the primary mirror of Planck. So this is a photon's eye view of Planck before it dies. It gives its life for science. So it's a beautiful picture. And there, it's, there are versions of it on the web. I really recommend looking at it because it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing instrument. So Planck doesn't just observe the sky with one frequency. It observes the sky in nine frequencies using this LFI instrument I talked about and the HFI instrument. And as you can see over sort of from radio to infrared, so first, the first thing you notice is none of these look, look like they don't have all this crud in the middle. So this crud is the Milky Way, and it's sort of there everywhere. And in fact, it literally is there everywhere because there's traces of it even where you can't see the red. So one of the important jobs that Planck and any any instrument like it must do is to separate out the bits you care about, the top and the bottom, from the bits that you don't care about if you're a cosmologist. Now, lots of astronomers cared very deeply about these other things, so there's, Planck is just a telescope, and it has nine frequency bands, and it looks at the whole sky. So as an astronomical instrument, it's sort of amazing. It's the, all, it's the whole sky, nine frequency bands, so Astronomers of all stripes can go to town on this. We can see things in the solar system. We can see things in the galaxy. We can see nearby galaxies. We can see very distant galaxies. And of course, the thing I care about the most, we can see the most distant light there is in the universe, the microwave background. Now, just getting to this point is sort of 50 million pixels. We compressed a lot of data from 500 trillion samples. So this is the first 
part where building models comes in. Because in order to be able to take these trillions of samples and make just these maps, you need to have a model for what's making these things happen. You need a model for your instrument, and you need at least some of a model for what's going on on the sky to be able to do this. So in order to do this data compression, we needed to do some modeling. So I think this is yet another um, uh, ESA provided. No, nope, okay, that was supposed to be a, a movie, but we don't care. So this is what you get when you do that modeling. The next step of it, which is to disentangle all of those different sources of what we call foreground emissions. So all the stuff between the microwave background and here, cosmologists just call foregrounds. All other astronomers call it light. Um, but we, so we care about that. And so this is our best guess for what the whole sky looks like in the microwave background alone, the stuff from very distant. So just to give you some context, so this is, of course, the first Penzias and Wilson picture. This is COBE. This is WMAP, and this is Planck. Now, this, unfortunately, is not the best way to show it, so blame the French. Um, but see, I've learned something being here for 11 years. You can always get a laugh at that. Um, so this looks, th th these, this, at this resolution, it's hard to tell how much better Planck is than WMAP. But it is, in fact, a lot better. And uh, you can see sort of 10 pixels of information per single pixel of WMAP information. It's really remarkably good. But that's why, that's because we had another 10 years to build the thing. To see it a little bit better, you can actually zoom in on a small patch of sky, so where Kobe could only see, you know, kind of one uniform color, maybe a little bit of information there. WMAP sees this, and Planck sees this. So there's just a lot more information available in the Planck data than there were in the WMAP data, and a huge amount more than were available in the Kobe data. What we do with that is we make this sort of plot. So this is compressing down from 50 million pixels to only 2,500 or so numbers. So this is what we called in a, in, a, in a work about, well, now 15 years ago, radical compression. Now this is, requires a lot of modeling to be able to go from this, this picture of the whole sky to just 2,500 numbers, right? So you obviously can't reproduce, or maybe it's not obvious, but you cannot reproduce the details of the whole sky from just this particular graph that you can make from those skies. It's a lossy compression, but it turns out that in terms of the information we care about, if our model is correct, and again, so modeling and probability is key to this, if our modeling is correct, then this picture contains, well, not all, but almost all of the information that's available to you on the sky. So this is pretty good. So we went from 500 trillion samples to a map of 50 million pixels to a, this is called a power spectrum of 2,500 numbers. And we've only graphed some bin version of that, so there aren't 2,500 numbers plotted here. Because in fact, if you look at it, it's pretty smooth. So you shouldn't need 2,500 numbers to describe that smooth curve. And in fact, the answer is you only need six. So Planck and admittedly not Planck alone, but Planck combined with other astrophysical data, lets us measure the amount of stuff and the kind of stuff in the universe. So if we do that, so this is unfortunately not come out very well, but we do find that the universe is dominated by this weird dark energy that's making it accelerate today. And this, to make this distinction, you certainly need other information than Planck can provide alone. There's this ordinary matter, so these protons and electrons we talked about before, are only this tiny, tiny little sliver here. And then the remaining bit is this so-called dark matter whose effects we know gravitationally, but whose, uh, whose phone number, whose, you know, we don't actually know what it is. We think it might live in a particle physics theory. Well, we better live in a particle physics theory, but we don't know what that theory actually is. Now, I said we can also use this data to measure the curvature of the universe. So that is shown in very cartoon form here. So this is a picture of our offices upstairs. So somewhat self-aggrandizingly, um, in addition to the work by Thomas Bayes uh, and work by uh, the person who's going to give the vote of thanks here, among other people, um, there's this picture here which actually shows, and I'll show you in a, in a more modern way in just a minute, uh, that the universe is flat geometrically. And that's one of the things that the microwave background, although this is pre-Planck, one of the things that the microwave background can measure. So here's a more modern version of that. So this plane here shows the amount of normal matter, so this is basically this plus this, versus the amount of this dark energy, this swathe here. And the data are these points. Well, they're the colored bits. You can't tell that they're points, really. 
And wherever there's a point, that is something that Planck alone is happy to have be the result of the universe. So Planck basically says that you live along this line here. Now, it turns out that if you, as you move along that line, you change something else. You change the expansion rate of the universe today, this Hubble constant I talked about earlier on. So if you have external information about that, then you can place yourself along this line. And when you do that, you end up living right here. So along this dashed line here, which is the bit where this plus this equals 1, and this plus this, omega matter and omega lambda, we call it, that's the total omega, that omega that I used earlier on, which tells you the geometry of the universe. So according to this, we live right near this dashed line, which says that indeed the universe does appear to be geometrically flat. So Planck plus other cosmological data tells us that the universe is flat, and it also tells us what that universe is made out of, which is pretty good. But there are open questions. So why does it flat? Flat is like one number, right? We picked omega equals one out of all the possibilities. It could have been zero, it could have been a million. Why one? One is sort of a weird point to be. And why, as I mentioned earlier on, is roughly speaking at the three degree Kelvin level, why are things almost exactly the same temperature everywhere? But why is it not exactly exactly the same temperature everywhere? Why are there these small lumps? And thank God there are because that's us, right? Without small lumps, we wouldn't be here. One possible example, everyone's favorite nowadays, is this theory called inflation, which is you take the small part of a, of a surface with any curvature at all, and you blow it up. And when you do that, you find that things look flat, right? If you, look, if you zoom in on anything, it looks flat. The best example of that, of course, is the Earth. But if you walk around London, you can't tell that the Earth is curved without doing very, very, very precise experiments. Right? So here's you know, New Jersey, for those of you who don't know what the states of the US look like. So I, I, um, I think I'm from around here, Fort Lee. Um, so we take a small part of the early universe, with it, whatever curvature it had, and we blow it up. So we give it a flat geometry by doing that. We also tend to smooth out what's there by blowing it up. So that gets rid of the initial lumps. But because we're taking stuff that was so very small to begin with and blowing it up to be so very large, quantum mechanics comes into play because we take the very small realm of quantum mechanics, we blow it up to be astrophysically large. But quantum mechanics is inherently random. As far as we know, the only way you can interpret quantum mechanics is to essentially posit that there are these weird random processes that happen that we have no control over, that are not just information we don't have, but literally have no other information available that you could imagine having. So-called hidden variables are not there. So we take these small amounts of randomness and we blow them up to being cosmologically large. So randomness, not just the probability of not knowing stuff, but the probability of stuff that we can't ever know is inherent in this model anyway of everything there is in the universe. So, so far anyway, inflation seems to pass all of the tests that, uh, that or the, the data that we have passes all the tests that inflation gives to us. The universe is nearly flat. It, the microwave background and, in fact, just structure on the whole, on large scales, is nearly uniform. And there is this small amount of randomness that has grown over time to be the large amount of stuff that we see in the universe today. So it started out as tiny, tiny lumps, but over time, gravity and then other physics starts to act. And you take these lumps and you build galaxies, and those, and those galaxies break up into stars. And the stars have planets around them and there's chemistry and television sets and people and biology, and here we are. Now, inflation may also predict more. Now, this depends on the details of the theory, but that's good because then that lets us understand the underlying theory, if we can measure this stuff. And in particular, it predicts that there should be background lumps not only in stuff, but in space-time itself. So you ping this rubber sheet analogy that you might have for space and time. Not a perfect analogy, but one that's good enough for our purposes. And you ping it in a way, kind of due to quantum mechanical randomness. And those things propagate, and we should be able to see them in the microwave background. And it turns out they induce a very specific pattern, not in the temperature of the microwave background, or not only in the temperature of the microwave background, but also in the polarization of the microwave background. So if any of you have polarized sunglasses, then you know that 
that when light scatters off of, let's say, water in this case, it's polarized. And you know that because when you put on polarized sunglasses, you actually reduce the glare. So this is a particular kind of scattering. But scattering of photons in the early universe also does that. So if we have polarized detectors, we can hopefully see some of this scattering going on. And it turns out that if you decompose the kind of picture that you get in a particular way, then you can find what is sadly not unambiguous information for this gravitational radiation in the early universe. So most recently, about a month or so ago, a month and a half or so ago, um, certainly if you know any cosmologists, but probably if you just read the newspapers, then you might have heard that this experiment called BICEP2 in the US has observed some of, these, some of the evidence for this. And I'll just uh, uh, do some self-aggrandizing here and point out that, that some of their strategy was, was originally pointed out by uh, me and uh, our, our vote of thanks speaker and, uh, and, uh, and a colleague of ours about 15 years ago. And when they do that, then they can make another one of these power spectrum pictures that I showed before. And I won't say much about it, just to say that this is all the previous data. These are just upper limits. And this new, this new set of data looks to be here. And it's comfortably away from zero. These aren't upper limits. These are actual measurements here, comfortably away from zero. There are other recent measurements that I've actually been more involved in that are also away from zero. But this isn't evidence of this fluctuating gravitational field. But these, if, if it holds up, and there is some interesting controversy going on in the uh, internets right now um, that maybe this, there may be some problems with these results, but you know, they're, they're very, very, very careful experimenters indeed. So uh, if this holds up, then there's, this is strong evidence that everything we see, everything we see, everything, has grown from these small random fluctuations early on, 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, and grown over 14 billion years or so to be the galaxies and clusters of galaxies and those things within them that we see today. So on that note, I will end with another quote. The universe is random. It's not inevitable. It's simple chaos. It's subatomic particles, an endless, aimless collision. That's what science teaches us, but what does it say? Does anyone know where this comes from? So it's Heisenberg, but not the Heisenberg you think. It's that Heisenberg um, in an episode of Breaking Bad called The Fly, uh, highly recommended. Um, and uh, on that, I'll end. Thank you.